Uh, yeah, thanks for letting me come out. Uh, yeah, like Kip said, my name is Eric Fieldsa. So I'm the I manage the Aquatic Basic Species Program at the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, and and our program has been around since 2012, when the you know the board uh, made invasive species a priority at the district. So I'm going to kind of walk you through our response to finding zebra mussels in Christmas Lake. Um, this slide is just kind of showing all the all the partners that have been involved in this. I mean, it's been pretty you know kind of complex. Uh, yeah, can everybody see that okay? A little focus. So I work really closely with the. Uh, all right, great. I work real closely with the DNR to implement this response. Um, the city of Shorewood, which is in Christmas Lake, um, we had involvement from the Minnesota AS Research Center, and we had to work with the Department of Ag, the MPCA on this, and many uh, private companies as well to help all make this happen. Um, so I just kind of listed out some basic steps of a rapid response. Um, the first step is obviously detecting the invasion. Um, and I have kind of our timeline here. So we detected it August 16th. Um, and I'll talk about each one of these. But, you know, the next step is kind of determining the extent of the infestation. Is it widespread? Is it, you know, is it small? Is it located in just one area? Um, you know, communication and education are important throughout this response for awareness. Um, you know, you can, then you get to kind of, you know, options for quarantine, like with barriers or, um, in our case, it was barriers. Uh, and then you get to the actual control of the infestation. And then finally, the final step is, you know, making sure you don't get reinfested. So uh, how we detected this invasion, we have a pretty extensive early detection monitoring program. Um, Part of that is using these samplers right here, and I brought an example with as well. Um, we basically have a rope, tie this to the underside of a dock. They hang in the water, probably about a foot off the bottom. Um, we check them. We try to check them at least at least twice a month, um, and you know we we use these on Minnetonka to assess the zebra mussel population. They work really well. Zebra mussels like to attach to these. Um, so this is actually how we detected this infestation. Um, we do have some other methods that we do as well. Um, last year was our first year of what we're calling a comprehensive early detection uh, protocol. We actually, uh, so we go out and we do a lot of uh, snorkeling. Um, we're looking for all kinds of AIS, not just zebra mussels. Um, the area in red, which is way up here, this is where the boat launch is. Um, we spent 30 minutes snorkeling there, looking for zebra mussels, invasive plants, and so on. And I should say, this was done on July 28th uh, on Christmas Lake. The sites in yellow are areas where we spent 10 minutes snorkeling. Um, you can see the kind of purplish dots out there. We did uh, zebra mussel veliger samples in those spots, as well as we looked for a spiny water flea, which is the kind of the blue lines. Um, so it's really important to know that, so we spent 30 minutes at the boat launch on July 28th and we didn't find anything and then August 16th, you know, we detected this really a large population at the boat launch. So we're really confident from this survey that we detected it within a, you know, a two and a half week time frame, which was turned out to be really critical. So yeah, August 16th um, is when we found them. We found them like four or five on this sampler. Uh, we checked some rocks around that area, found some additional. Um, first step is, you know, notify the DNR, uh, met them on the lake. This was actually a Saturday. We met them on the lake Monday morning um, to do a, a water survey on the lake. So this is map down here. It's just kind of showing uh, the extent of our, our initial lakewide survey to determine the extent of the population. All the dots are areas we checked. And you know, at the, each of those dots, we checked, you know, you know, 100 meters or so, or, you know, a, more than just one little spot. It's, it's more of an extent of, of a shoreline. Uh, and we did some additional villager toes. We'll note we did not find any villagers throughout this whole process. Um, the only zebra mussels we found were up at the access, and you know we're very fortunate that 
they were all of, of juvenile size and not of, of a reproductive age, which certainly aided in, uh, in the response as well. Um, and the other maps just showing areas by the boat launch where we took additional Bellinger samples. Like I said, communication and uh, education throughout this are important. Um, so we worked with you know, the DNR and the, and the city to um, you know, create awareness of so what, we, what we found and kind of the next steps we're thinking. Um, we worked with the DNR for a press release on this. Uh, we also utilized our social media to get the word out. Um, you know, the DNR updated their signs pretty quickly uh, for anybody using the access to, to be aware. So because we found them at the public access and at that spot only, um, we decided to, we worked the DNR in the city of Shore and we decided to uh, install a barrier around where we found the zoo mussels and that kind of serves two purposes. One, it contains the population and prevents them from spreading out to the rest of the lake while we have some time to get in there and control them. Uh, and secondly, um, they're very important for the actual treatment itself. It helps maintain that, you know, whatever product or chemical you're using, maintain it in that area so that the, the zoo mussels receive that appropriate contact time. Um, so that was actually installed on, on our August 21st, so you know, five days after we found them. So all this happened pretty quickly. Um, we had to close down the access, and we only, we only closed it down because this is where the zoo mussels were found. If we would have found them elsewhere in the lake, we could have left the access open, and we could have installed the barriers around that location. Um, so that's why the access was closed. So when we got to control, um, options are kind of limited for zoo mussels. Um, we were fortunate enough, uh, Zequinox, which you probably have heard of, um, they just received their uh, EPA uh, approval for their label for use in, in lakes, basically. Um, so that was a, an easy option that could be permitted. Um, in the past, uh, copper-based products have been used as well. And then we kind of had one other option, which was this potash, potassium chloride. Um, this is not a registered uh, pesticide, so it needs a special approval from the EPA, but there has been a couple instances where this has been used um, and 100% you know, eradication has been achieved. So this was kind of the, you know, our goal, but that was gonna take a lot of work and work through you know, the Minnesota Department of Ag through the EPA to get that approval. So work on that got started pretty quick, but in the meantime, we were able to uh, treat with Zequinox. So the Zequinox treatment occurred on September 8th. Um, you know, so we're looking at a couple weeks after we found them, uh, two to three weeks, I guess. Um, and this is just showing the three ways that we kind of judged mortality during this treatment. Um, in our lab, on the far picture, we set up actually Aquaria and Basically, we took, uh, before the treatment, zoo mussels from the lake, put them in tubes in each of those aquariums. Um, three of the tanks had just, you know, water, lake water before the treatment, and then we put in uh, water after the product was applied uh, into the other three, so we were able to judge uh, in a lab setting how well it was working. In the field, we used uh, this big tub in, in, in a cage we had uh, basically a set amount of zoo mussels put in each one. Um, so at this access, most of the zoo mussels were on rocks, really small rocks actually. Um, so we just put these rocks into, into these in the tub uh, and we'd go out every day and we'd count how many are dead, how many are alive, um, you know, as a judge for mortality. And then we'd also just do kind of a random sample uh, in the treatment area. So we'd we basically pick up enough rocks and count it up to you know 200 z mussels and count how many are alive or, or dead to get to that point. Um, so we did achieve through all these methods um, 
They are all really consistent with each other, which is really good. Um, so we believe we achieved 100% mortality in this treatment area by 11 days. Um, but I will note that it probably wasn't just the Zequinox alone. Um, in past trials with the product, you know, they've been getting results with mortality in the upper 90%. Um, they haven't really documented 100% eradication. But with the product itself, with it breaking down the process it goes through, um, we left our barriers intact, which is somewhat, you know, kind of a different use. Um, so basically in a contained area with this product breaking down, we also had no dissolved oxygen in this area, which I believe aided in the treatment. So a combination of Zequinox, no dissolved oxygen, we got 100% mortality. This is, there's some photos from the treatment. Uh, you can see it, it's kind of hard to tell here, but it turns the water very cloudy, very white. It's very noticeable. Um, and then these are some photos of the treatment company applying the product. Um, it is kind of a difficult product to apply. It takes some, um, a lot of mixing, but uh, you know, it was successful. So after, uh, after, after that treatment, you know, we kept searching in the lake. Um, up to that point, we haven't been able to get scuba divers out into some of the deeper portions of the lake by the access. So um, we finally organized uh, nine scuba divers on September 19th to just do a really extensive uh, survey in the bay where the access is located. Um, and during that survey, so for reference, uh, the public access at Christmas Lake, um, the, our treatment area is very, uh, there's just a lot of rocks and these rocks are brought in uh, to basically to stabilize the access. Outside of these rocks, um, it's very mucky, very soft substrate. You know, zero muscles like that hard substrate to attach to. So there was limited, basically limited habitat for them um, outside of this, uh, the, the treatment area that we cordoned off with barriers. Um, but what our search found was an additional 25 mussels just kind of scattered, still within you know 50 feet of the barrier, but just outside the barrier. Um, but these were found on just random uh, branches that were on the bottom of the lake, uh, one native mussel. Um, we removed all these, so now we had a situation where you know, our immediate treatment area, which was relatively small, you know, 50 feet by 60 feet. Um, we believe we had 100% mortality there, but we had these 25 outside, and there's still a question remains, you know, are there one or two, five more hiding out there? Um, you know, odds are probably. So we decided to expand the treatment area and treat again. Uh, so here's just a photo of how we expanded the barrier. We went from basically a 50 foot by 60 foot area to you know, almost three quarters of an acre. Um, it was probably, it's still easily double the size of where we actually found the mussels. It's just an added precaution. Um, you know, let's treat a bigger area, make sure we're getting, uh, you know, anything that's there. So that was done on October 14th. Uh, by then, water temps were cooling down. Um, you know, speaking with the manufacturers at Zequinox, uh, their, the product uh, does lose some efficacy in cooler water. So, you know, you might go from upper 90% to, you know, maybe 60% mortality. Uh, you know, it's kind of unclear. They haven't done a lot of research with water temps at that point. Um, but they have been finding that it's not as effective in cooler water. We're still at this point, we're still waiting on um, getting approval for the potash. So our kind of only option at this point is to look at copper products. Um, this product that we use is called EarthTech QZ. Um, it has zero muscles on the label, but it's very similar to our other copper products. Um, the issue that we ran into, all copper products usually have, you can only treat once every 14 days, and that's on the label to, um, limit you know dissolved oxygen issues with decaying algae and so on um, we really weren't concerned about that on christmas lake 
in October. I mean, there's very little algae in Christmas light to begin with. It's very uh, of good water uh, quality, um, especially by October. There's very limited um, algae in the lake, and we were not worried about um, dissolved oxygen getting bad. Um, so we had to work with the Minnesota Department of Ag to modify or get a special label that would allow us to treat more frequently to maintain this dose that, that's been found to provide 100% um, uh, mortality in, in some lab studies. So these treatments occurred uh, November 3rd through the 10th. Um, and I know by November 10th, we already had ice forming in the treatment area. Um, because you know, we've already removed all the mussels we found in the lake, the only way we could assess the results of this treatment were in a lab setting, replicating the treatment. Um, so that was done in our lab. Um, and like I said, the reason we treated was there was still a possibility that you know, a handful of mussels could still exist out in that area. So the top picture is just showing the the final, copper, the final copper treatment on November 10th, and then by the 13th we had ice in that contained area. Um, we did, you know, in our lab, our lab trials, we did achieve 100% mortality um, after seven days with the copper. So, um, in ideal conditions, it, it you know it does work, which is encouraging. Uh, it's just getting through that label process, and I've been told that actually these companies are working on modifying their label with the EPA that would allow these more frequent treatments, which is, which is very good. It'd be just a, another tool with less uh, hoops to jump through. Um, and, you know, the main difference in our lab trials versus, versus in the field were, was water temp. And water temp can always play a factor in, in treatments. Um, obviously, we couldn't uh, maintain cold water temps in our lab, but uh, obviously, they were near freezing in the field. So that is one difference. Uh, so we did re finally receive uh, approval for, for potash, which is potassium chloride. Um, so like I mentioned, there's been two, a couple instances where this has work, worked really well. One was in its Virginia quarry. It's like 12 acres, completely confined, no inlets, no outlets. Uh, we had very little mixing under the ice. Um, so very uneven concentrations. It all kind of settled at the deepest area, and some of it settled into the sediment. We did some sediment monitoring. Um, so we thought we'd try uh, one attempt at you know mixing up this product in this area via just some aeration. Um, so we tried that in January. Um, it still resulted in kind of this uneven concentration throughout this area. Um, we we did we were able to pinpoint there was an area in the, in the treatment area that did receive you know, what would have been a lethal concentration, um, but that was not throughout. And you know, it's, I will note that you know, we were pretty confident that we, we likely killed anything that remained with the copper treatments. I mean, there were pretty extensive treatments. We, got, we maintained a, a high dose for a long time. Um, so the potash was just another added measure um, but I'm still pretty confident that we, we killed everything in, in that treatment area. And obviously the final step of any kind of rapid response is, is the prevention of a reinfestation. Um, so you know, we're working through, um, you know, evaluating the weaknesses in, in the, you know, the existing program out there and how we can strengthen that to, to prevent this kind of situation in the future. So I just listed some of the kind of take home points through all this work. Um, obviously, early, early detection was the absolute key in all this. It allowed us to find this localized population and treat it. Um, you know, we treated with all the available tools that were out there. That probably won't, you know, be, be what's likely in you know future situations for other lakes. Hopefully, we developed enough information from this that you know you can pick the right tool for your situation. Um, you know, all this really occurred pretty quickly if you think about what we did. I mean, all within four months, three different treatments, you know, different approvals for the Department of Ag, EPA. Um, so there's a lot of people who work really hard on this to, to make it happen because um, they realized the unique situation that was Christmas Lake. 
we caught it so early, we actually had a chance at eradication, which does not happen often. Um, so, and then I think the ultimate key is just to be adaptive throughout this process. Um, you know, your next step is going to be based on, you know, the results of what you're currently doing, which could change each time. So, you know, even though if you may have a plan in place, you think it's going to go perfectly, it's very likely it'll change, you know, throughout the whole, the whole process. Um, you know, we have plenty of questions on what does this actually cost. Uh, so, you know, hard cost, we estimate, you know, around $20,000. Um, you know, the watershed paid for a portion and the DNR paid for a portion of this as well. Um, a lot of it was, uh, you know, the barriers are, uh, are one of the bigger expenses of the process. As well, you know, Actually, the, the product itself was not that bad. Um, Zequinox was the most expensive. Um, for that small area we treated, it was around $5,500. Um, the copper and potassium are really fairly cheap. Um, so the barriers were a lot of cost, and then just getting extra extra manpower in there to survey, do the scuba work, um, those sorts of those sorts of costs. And obviously, uh, it doesn't include staff time from from us from the DNR. Um, you know, it's really occupied our time from August to to January. 